So hi everyone. Uh, we have a stellar topic for the day. Strategies for SaaS platforms as well as education platform in partnership with Hatch, CurveUp and Blue Lotus. To moderate it, we have Fawaz, founder of CurveUp and he has been the face of education platforms for the last decade. And to talk about it, we have Nelson Sivalingam, a serial entrepreneur, co-founder and CEO of HowNow, an education technology company and he has been recognized as one of the top 30 young innovative founders of by uh, Virgin Media Business and also top Asian star in tech by KPMG. First of all, uh, I would like to thank Nelson for accepting our invitation and coming on board as a panelist to share your thoughts. And I would like to start things off by asking the first question for the day. Uh, why did you start How Now? Well, first, thanks for having me, uh, guys. Um, why do I start How Now? That's a, that's a big one. So I guess that m most of us have probably worked in big corporate companies, and you've probably noticed that a lot has changed about work, and a lot has changed about the, the way we um, communicate with each other. You know, now you're using tools like Slack, you're using tools like Teams. Um, the way you manage resources has changed. So everything about the way we work has changed apart from the way we train people. And so if you look over the kind of last decade or so, the way we train employees and the way we upskill people is very much the same. And so that combined with the fact that the one thing everyone in my team has in common is we've all been victims of really bad training. So we know what bad training looks like within companies. And so it looks like a problem that was ripe for disruption. Um, and so we asked ourselves the question of what would learning look like if you built it from scratch today? So rather than trying to build on legacy systems, let's scrap everything we've seen up until now and build something from scratch that fits in with the modern ecosystem of enterprise software. And in our attempt to answer that question, we, we landed on how now. I mean, we didn't get straight there. We took the scenic route. Uh, to get there and we, we tested out multiple different things but essentially we were we started how now because we were trying to answer the question of what would learning look like today right uh, brilliant uh, nelson again uh, thank you for everyone for joining uh, nelson i have a very interesting perspective uh, to drive so you also said about how you landed in uh, how now we are to be modernizing education and modernizing. Just I'm going to drive away from this education platform and come into a very uh, a soft as a service or platform as a service perspective of it. Uh, what made you to choose that way of uh, empowerment uh, during, uh, towards these particular platforms, right? Because if you look at how software can change process and how software can have, including learning to all the optimization, how, what made you towards a SaaS driven uh, solution or SaaS driven uh, platform? Yeah, good question for us. So when we started out, it wasn't uh, B2B SaaS. So what we were, um, the problem we were trying to solve was the problem of skills gaps. So if you look at countries uh, you know, around the world, um, we have this problem of a growing skills gap where the workforce don't have the skills they need um, to be able to, essentially cater to the needs of, of the market. And if we don't close the skills gap, it's a big problem, a big social problem, because you end up with people who are both socially and economically irrelevant, which is a big problem for every country. So what we were trying to solve was this skills gap problem. So when we were exploring options, we did explore a B2C option. So we were looking at, okay, could we create a marketplace that can make it easier for people to develop the skills they need? And then we looked at, can we give um, independent experts the tools to be able to share and monetize their knowledge? And so we tried various different um, use cases and various different verticals. And what we realized was one of the verticals we were testing was B2B SaaS. It was selling to organizations to use our software uh, for internal training and internal upskilling. And there's a couple of things we realized. First thing was we were better at B2B. And that's, I think, a really important thing for founders to realize is, you know, what business are you better suited to building? 
And we realized we were better at building B2B because we were better at selling B2B, right? Rather than building a volume-based B2C business, we were better at being in the room with the client and being able to tell them what the benefits were and to, to sell them the vision of what the product could do. We were also better at making really good software, right? And so we take a very much a design first approach. And we believe that um, a design first approach, especially in product development, is, is the key to disrupting big um, enterprise SaaS markets. And so we thought for that reason, we were good at building B2B SaaS products. And, and that was really the two reasons um, that we thought we were better suited. And the third reason was it's where we found product market fit. And out of all of these verticals that we tested with B2B organizations, they had an allocated budget for buying this kind of software. And um, there was an allocated buyer within the organization. So you knew exactly which stakeholder to speak to within the organization. And that was our reason for going down that route. Uh, Nelson, we lost you for about last 30 seconds. Oh, um, so I was just saying the alignment of our skill set, uh, the alignment of the way we build products, and the final part meaning the product market fit we had, um, and realizing that we were better suited and we had the good product market fit for B2B SaaS, they were the reasons why we went down that route. A brilliant way uh, to put it out. So I'm again gonna uh, drive in deep before we cope opening up uh, other uh, question and answers from our audience out there. I'm just gonna drive in deep so that there's uh, adequate information out there. So what was very really interesting to learn or hear about that when you said you tested more other verticals, right? And also this is not, you didn't land here directly, right? So I would like to know about before coming into a SaaS driven platform, what are the other verticals you uh, tested and also how are the experience of testing the other verticals, the other way of executing the system has helped you to uh, drive towards a successful platform? Sure. So I, I guess it's, you know, we had tested out various different B2C. So even within B2C, we had tested different segments. Uh, you know, adult learning, but within adult learning, there are different um, subjects you could have covered. And um, we tried marketplace, then we tried, uh, you know, on-demand courses. Uh, then we looked at within B2B, um, you know, we looked at training providers who need to go online. So do we give them our software and they use our software to go online? Um, and then, like I mentioned before, we were also giving our software to organizations um, to use it for their internal employees. We had some organizations who were using it for customer training or partner training. So as you can see, there are so many different verticals we are testing. And, and you know, this is typically the approach we recommend, right? Is, is before you double down and start committing to a particular way of doing things, is to test all of this out. But when you're testing it, you need to be systematic in the way you test. And, and I always think about testing in, in the same way, you know, back at school, you do science experiments where they make you fill out the, you know, the hypothesis and what's the method and, and, you know, what are your results and what are your conclusion? I pretty much use the same format for, for building businesses is, you know, every time I test something out, I do exactly that form. I fill out a hypothesis. I write my method, which could be five steps, six steps. And, and testing it out, and because it gives you a clear way to measure if this is working or not. And sometimes you can make the mistake that just because it's making a bit of money, you think it's working. But that's not the measure. Right? What you're looking at is the rate, is, is how quickly is this growing, or how quickly are you converting, or what is the sales cycle? Does one vertical have a, smaller, a shorter sales cycle than the other vertical? Um, is the average contract value bigger for one vertical than it is for the other vertical? So making sure you're comparing it with the right um, factors. And so we looked at that and that's how we realized actually this is the better market for us because it had a better contract value, average contract value. Um, it had, you know, it wasn't a short sales cycle, but it was a good sales cycle for the deal size that you were getting. 
Um, and also, you know, how much effort did it take from our side? So for all of those different reasons that we reviewed, we thought this was the better market for us to go to. But we, we tested all of these verticals in that way. I think uh, that's a very brilliant approach. And uh, I also would uh, share a little more in terms of how we also kind of tested. But however, the verticals that you uh, tested was more or less very scientific and methodic. So which made you a constructed result. So something that I would emphasize on a takeaway out of this webinar is it's okay to do whatever you want to, but have a very systematic methodical approach towards before you land into a SaaS platform. Because I do hear from uh, uh, early bird uh, founders or uh, immediate founders who's coming into a, a gap of opportunity because I know all this has created a lot of gap so that which could be filled with opportunities of platforms or technological driven uh, software. So then I see that is being directly coming towards a uh, SaaS platform. So again, I'm going to keep a product development a little uh, away. I'm just going to touch on, but uh, right now, since we on the last discussion and just keeping it very uh, clear and open, this is a very constructive discussion we're going on, not a predefined uh, Q&A. So you talked about money part of it, transactional part of it, right? In, in terms of system, right? Uh, people have educated budget and also the customer acquisition. So what I'm interested right now is to also to understand how do you quantify, how do you involve in a transaction of customers in a completely a B2B or a SaaS driven platform, right? So how do you see that or your customer acquisition, especially you talked about your growth rate, not about your customer, right? The, the rate, the curve of it, right? So how do you measure that? How do you see the customer acquisition rate and customer retention rate? How does this play a role in uh, being a successful SaaS platform? Yeah, for sure. So I, it really depends at what stage you're at in your business, right? Because sometimes you can overwhelm yourself with metrics because there's a lot of metrics you can measure, but there are certain metrics that are more relevant depending on what stage of the business you're, you're in. And, and so, you know, if you're not at the point where you're looking to accelerate the growth, then, you know, reducing your cost per acquisition, uh, you know, cutting down your sales cycle might not be the priority. The priority for you might be just getting your conversion and, and knowing the conversion rate between, um, you know, leads to qualified opportunities um, to how many of those deals that you win. And so I think you need to be clear on which metrics are important at which stage in, in your business, but also within B2B SaaS, I mean, it, it's a big uh, breadth of kind of customers, right? So you could be selling to startups and, and kind of uh, maybe even kind of smaller end of the SME market, in, in which case your customer acquisition could be very different. It might not make sense for you to have a direct sales team and to invest that money. Um, you might invest in more kind of building out an inbound marketing engine where people can come to the site, they can sign up themselves, they can trial the platform. Once, whilst they're trialing the platform, maybe you have um, inside sales teams who get involved at that point um, and then they kind of nurture that lead and look to convert it. Um, Maybe if you go into more mid-market, so by mid-market, I mean, if you're looking at kind of thousand employees plus, uh, and the, in terms of kind of, I would say the window of kind of thousands to 3000 employees uh, bracket, you might have a direct sales team. You might have outbound prospecting. So cold outreach emails, for example, as an acquisition channel. And, and so you would have different costs associated there. And then if you're going enterprise, it's a completely different beast, right? Because your enterprise deal could take anywhere between nine to 12 months. And it's going to take a lot more nurturing than sign up for a free trial after seeing an advert, right? And so it costs a lot more money. It means you need to have more experienced salespeople. You might have a partnership network of, of people who are referring opportunities your way. And so really the acquisition funnel and the acquisition cost really depends on the type of product, the cost of your product and who your customers are. Brilliant. Uh, I think uh, that actually boils down a lot of theories and strategies behind uh, towards your approach. So again, uh, taking this particular uh, conversation a little more advanced towards empowering people who are looking forward 
to come on board to uh, empower or automate this particular digitalization so i have two questions so number one i'm going to talk about this autopiloting because i that was a beautiful uh, science you were talking about uh, getting a cup guide to uh, from a premium to premium strategy where you try for free and you commit yourself and depending of your organization size you carry the a ladder forward and at a point you involve a sales team for a conversion right so from this standpoint where do you see a platform of this nature saas driven tech, uh, strategies where it help to downsize your team to make sure it can most of the operation can be autopilot right how how you, what is your thought about it because i am i am sure including myself there's more out uh, at due tech entrepreneurs or saas driven uh, technology entrepreneurs who have who is fighting between team size and the capacity they should have to uh, towards the selling capacity they should go for but i also see the saas platform is one of the smart way where autopiloting is naturally happening although it's not a strategy behind how do you see this autopiloting and also uh, saas driven uh, strategies helping for company to scale within minimum capacity for sure so i think this is a huge people think when you say um okay second i think we've just frozen that i'm back yeah, uh, again i think we yes. just froze for a bit and yes. Yeah. So when uh, just talking about the marketing piece, so typically when we talk about uh, marketing, people typically think about traditional marketing channels. You know, they they, they think about um, you know paid media and and you know Google AdWords, Facebook AdWords, and and that's the the, the way to kind of generate your customer base. But actually, with 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 a SaaS platform, when you talk about growth, your product is also a part of the marketing mix. Right, so I'll give you an example. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with. There's a product called Notion, um, which is like a, a, a kind of, I guess, in note-taking uh, kind of tool. And those guys have just kind of built a multi-billion-pound business. And up until recently, they had 40 people in their team, right? And and more than half of that team, I think two-thirds of that team was engineers. And so they had a very, very small team who were focused on the user acquisition and, and, and the sales and conversion part of it. Now, that goes to show that is not the traditional way we think about sales and marketing. They had built so much of the acquisition into the product. By that, what I mean is, um, is your product self-service enough? So could a user sign up to that platform, um, trial the platform, and realize the full value of the platform without ever having human contact with someone who's within your organization, right? So that is not your traditional marketing. That is using your product as a fundamental part of the way you market um, what you do. And, and so that's a really important part of, um, you know, having a lean team, but driving user acquisition. Then coming to what you mentioned around kind of marketing automation. Now, this is very much, um, it doesn't require a lot of people, but it definitely requires someone who understands um, both brand, right? They, you need to understand that brand is more than just your logo or the colors on your website. Your brand is every touch point you have with your customer. Is it consistent with your tone of voice? Is it consistent with your product and your worldview? And so someone who understands brand, someone who understands customer journey, right? So, um, I mean, we could probably talk hours just about marketing automation, but just to give you an example, if someone downloaded a ebook, right? At that point, where are they in your customer funnel? Um, and what should you show them next, right? So they've downloaded an ebook. So maybe I send them another couple of ebooks or another guide. At what point do they give me an indication that they're interested in more? At what point do they tell me, actually, you've now told me everything I need to know about the problem and I'm ready to see what's out there in the market, right? At that point, maybe um, they might go to your blog, which compares the different type of products in the market. And the moment they go to that blog, they've now told you, I'm ready to compare what's in the market. At that point, you need to now start giving them different types of content. An example could be an RFP template. Right now that I know you're considering it, 
I know you might be going, uh, going into an RFP process. So why not steer the direction of your RFP process by saying, here's a free RFP template, right? We did the hard work of listing all of the features you would need when you're going to buy an ERP solution, for example, right? And so that moment, the moment they go out to the market, looking for a platform with all of these requirements, you obviously fit those requirements because you wrote the RFP, right? And so that funnel is where marketing automation comes in, right? And, and it is a science. It is a science of looking at, okay, if someone comes here and they do this action, they will then go to either of these four options. And, but the great thing is once you've built that funnel, it doesn't take many people to be able to service that funnel, right? It almost becomes a well-oiled machine where someone goes in, they go through to the steps, automated, they qualify themselves, and this is what you call marketing qualified lead. And once you get a marketing qualified lead, it goes through to your sales development rep. So you could have a smaller team of sales development reps who are essentially getting qualified marketing leads that they can then start to service. I mean, that's on a very, very top level. Uh, and, and that How was your so life? Was your <laughs> okay. Again, we lost you for the uh, last uh, 30 seconds, but again, the, I beautifully said, uh, Nelson, uh, again, I'm emphasizing every single time the uh, key takeaway is uh, the scientific way of looking at your funnel and also mapping your customer journey, right? And uh, especially the stage of the customer growth, where are the customers are. Uh, and I think that was beautifully laid out from a freemium to premium and also where do you take what sort of an action? And uh, I was just keenly looking at Nidushan was nodding his head uh, when you talk about uh, RFB formats to be given so that your vendors are very interested about the features that you have. But again, uh, on a strategical standpoint, that goes a very long way where that was a very positive influence towards your vendors where you give information, adequate information, and also sometimes uh, the approach why I'm re-emphasizing that approach uh, with Nelson here is most of the time giving out an RFP format also thought as a very competitive disadvantage. People take it very competitive disadvantage uh, saying that, okay, we are, we are giving everything and if it is not awarded to us, so what if, if they modify it further, it can be backfire. Uh, and also securing it as in as a format, but again, the customer loyalty of it and the impression how they get into it the automation part where it goes along with again the yeah, SaaS automation. Just, just on that point Faz, i think especially now in a post-covid world I, as a business um if you're marketing yourself i think you have to take a give 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 then take approach right if, if in the first point of contact you're looking to take you're you're trying to say book a demo, uh, you know, look at my platform, it's, it's not going to work, right? So you need to give, give, give value. And I repeat it three times because it could take that much time to give lots of value to cut through, um, to, to cut through the noise. And so, you know, when people talk about what if I put out an RFP template and someone else uses it, or, you know, some companies I've come across and they say, we don't put our pricing on the website because what if my competitors see the pricing? Uh, you know, some people uh, don't give a free trial because they're worried, what if my competitor goes into the free trial? The, the truth is this, we all know what questions our customers are asking, right? We all know, if I was, let's use ERP again, right? If I'm going to buy an ERP system, we all know people are going to Google and they're searching best ERP systems. We know that, right? And, and we also know people are searching how much does an ERP system cost, right? If you made a list of every question you know a customer will ask, and you know the customers are asking these questions because you talk to customers every day, right? And I strongly believe the person who answers those questions, right, is the one who will cut through the noise. So say, for example, if you know your customer is going to search for uh, the best ERP um, solutions in the market, why not create a blog that says, here are the best ERP solutions, right? 
obviously you're one of the solutions, but there are five other solutions because the truth is the way you do um, your software might not fit for everyone. I can say that from our perspective, right? So I don't think how now as a learning platform is for everyone, right? You need to have a certain mindset. You need to have a certain organizational structure to really get the value. And if we don't see that fit, then we would be the first ones to tell the customer, look, I don't think this is going to work, right? If you think you can do X, Y, Z, then maybe it'll work. But if you can't, then you're probably better off using platform A. And so the truth is, if you answer those questions, you now position yourself in the market as an expert. And the bottom line is people buy from experts. And so what you should be focusing on at this time in this kind of market is how do you make sure you position yourself as an expert in your market? I think, uh, brilliant. You have answered uh, a question that I was about to ask as well. Uh, that, is, that shows that how expert you are on what you are talking. But uh, also, I'm very sure the COVID impact, how the dynamics of industries operate, especially around automation has changed, right? So again, uh, guys, like since we are exactly half the time over, I'm opening up uh, for Q&A from audience, from uh, social media, uh, the pages that we are live on. Yes, let, let that uh, come in. So I'm still going to drive on. Uh, that's a very key, important part in your introduction and in your profile, uh, which most of uh, SaaS-driven platform entrepreneurs or edu, edu, uh, sorry, technopreneurs uh, would really keenly look at that uh, you have raised a, a 4.5 million uh, pounds uh, with preceding a series, right? So why I keep en emphasizing on it is what stage were you able to uh, raise that? And this particular SaaS strategy towards the raising, how it has helped. So again, I'm connecting the theme of conversation. So this raising funds and how it has connected towards the uh, uh, SaaS strategy of uh, what we are talking about. Sure. So, uh, you know, on a top level, I mean, we've raised that funding over, I would say, three different rounds. You know, we had a smaller pre-seed, then we had a, a what you would call seed, and then we had a late seed, which is kind of the bridge between a, a kind of series A and, and kind of later stage seed. Um, on a top level with fundraising, right, I think what you're doing every step of the way when you're building your business is you're removing the risks, right? The more risks you remove from your business, um, the more money you can raise at a better valuation, right? On a, on a simplistic level, that's essentially what you're doing. Because on, on day one, when I started my business, I had 100 assumptions, right? And because there were 100 assumptions, someone was only willing to give me X amount of money for Y valuation. Then the next time I raised money, I had 60 assumptions because I had validated the other 40. And so now they're willing to give me more money at a better valuation. And, and that's how I look at fundraising is throughout the process, you, you always have assumptions. The question is how many of these assumptions have you proven and how much have you de-risked the business? And, and then I think that's what drives how much you can raise and, and what value you raise at. And, that's on once you've decided to fundraise. But I think there's a really important question that founders need to ask themselves is, A, do I need money? And, and, and B, how much money do I need if I decide to raise money? Because raising money does change how you run the business, right? And because there are certain expectations now and, and you have to now build it. You need to show a, a particular growth trajectory now because there are, other stakeholders, you know, there, there's kind of external capital involved. And so I think what you don't want to do is get into a trap where you think raising money is an achievement because, you know, it's, it could be a personal achievement because it's a hard process, right? It's like a full-time job to try to raise capital, but it's not a, any indication of how successful your business is. Right? Because there are incredible businesses that are able to grow self-sustainable, bootstrap all the way without raising capital. Um, and so you only raise capital because you think it will move you from A to B. And, and so for us, you know, it wasn't, we didn't raise more money because it was SaaS or, or because it was because by shifting to B2B SaaS, we had proven more assumptions. 
right? We had proven that actually the reason why we're going B2B SaaS is because L&D departments all have a budget for our product. Typically, the average budget for the product is X. Uh, there is a managed sales process, and we had also validated the customer because we had now got significant brand names who had bought our product, and we had validated that right now with X, we're able to convert Y. If we 10X, we should be able to get 10Y. That's what we had proven. So it was less about the fact that it was SaaS. It was more about the fact that we had de-risked the business. Uh, again, great. So I, I really love that part of uh, how much the risk that you take off, make sure how better you can grow. And also the science of assumption uh, directly connected towards uh, the valuation of the company and the amount of funds that you can raise, right? So again, very clearly on a structure takeaway that I, what I wanted to emphasize is if you really are looking for fundraising, make sure that you really know what are the assumptions, right? So you have assumptions and you know that is an assumption, right? So then there's not validated. And then every single time you move towards for the next round, you have certain validation done already, which also gives a room that you can have more assumption left or more assumption added to the list but you have been growing towards uh, reducing the number of assumptions you have and the valuation and what you want and brilliantly what why and how much you want money right from a totally from a fundraising perspective uh, the fund is raised and sustainability and you beautifully told about it can become a trap or basically it can be a blessing or a curse right and fighting between a fundraising of blessing and the curse right how do you see product innovation because most of the time that i have seen a brilliant SaaS platforms has come into the market and one of my previous startup is a personal experience for me i think at a certain point the product innovation kind of ceased very slowly which also ended up that uh, the entire journey uh, had a different experience right so fundraising blessing to boost it up because now the market is global whether even if you are focusing a niche market your market is global so to attract a global market in a very competitive environment especially post covid i see a lot of solutions and it's not the awareness you need you need to go and do a conversion to have a conversation between a potential client takes a lot of effort because a lot of people are offering solution now because nobody knows the quality credibility perception but there's a lot of noise around it now you need money to bypass all these things or to create a continuous awareness right so my question is uh, nelson it can be a blessing or a curse but it's provided that fact you need money to have a global market approach and you need to continually uh, do a product innovation how do you see this scenario especially in a post-COVID impact or a post-COVID uh, business environment? Yeah, so, so I guess let me break that into two parts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, one, yeah. One, is, one is more of a kind of product development approach and, and then the Correct. other one is around marketing in a post-COVID world. Correct. See, so you get different types of founders, right? You get technical founders, you get product-oriented founders, you get sales-oriented founders. And uh, for me, I'm very much a product-oriented founder, right? And by that, what I mean is, um, I'm here to solve a problem. That's what excites me is I see a problem here and my product is a way of solving that problem. And I think sometimes that gets missed in, in, in a lot of SaaS products where you end up with, this would be a cool idea, but does that cool idea solve a problem or not is not really looked at. Right, so you end up with a product that you think would be cool if it existed, but you don't really know whether it would solve a, a problem or not. Because you don't know whether it solves a problem or not, every time um, a prospective client says, it would be great if your product also did this, what you end up doing is you end up adding those features, right? Because you don't necessarily have a clear idea of what problem you're solving. And therefore, every time a customer asks you a, a customization or feature, you do it, right? But if you had a clear idea that I know what your problem is, right? And, and therefore I am single-minded focus on solving that problem for you. And, and this is one of my problems actually with the RFP process is 
with organizations, they shouldn't, in an RFP process, it makes no sense for them to list, um, you know, requirements because they're not the expert, right? We're, we're the solution architect. We're building the product. So really what they should be doing is telling us what their problems are. And that's what we should be doing as the product owner is once they give you the requirement, say, look, this is great, but what problem are you actually trying to solve? And, and then focus on building your product around that. And that's really what product innovation and product development is. It's not about having hundreds of features. It's not about having AI for the sake of having AI, right? It's about solving the problem and, and are you solving the problem better than anyone else? And I think if you do that, that doesn't necessarily cost a lot of money. And that doesn't necessarily take 200 engineers because look at how many enterprise companies have hundreds of engineers, but do they have the best product? No, I don't think so, right? So then marketing in a post-COVID world, I think this is where more an expert-led, content-led approach matters because you need to cut through the noise, right? Everyone's going to do, you know, you could all spend money on adverts. Everyone could do, uh, you know, tons and tons of, even with content, everyone's doing content. You know, we were talking earlier about how many people are doing webinars and how many people are putting blogs out. So you need to be able to cut through the noise but i think the people who would be able to cut through the noise the, the people who will cut through the noise are the people who know their customers problem the most right it's not the person who does the most amount of webinars the most amount of blogs or does the most amount of paid adverts it's the person who understands the problem so well, they are able to communicate and talk about the problem in the same way the customer would. And, and I think that's what we're doing right now is we're focusing on getting to know that customer and the customer's problem better so we can cut through the noise because that is going to be the bigger challenge in the post COVID world. I think, uh, again, I can't, I can't say how important that is uh, most of the areas that you covered including a very content driven approach and specifically turning into be an SME that is subject matter expert of the area that what you are uh, talking around. So again, uh, from that uh, very key uh, takeaway that I will emphasize is more towards that you really know the product and you have a real intention to understand the customer problem. So it has to be very uh, problem centric innovation uh, instead of very solution driven innovation, right? So you were the, in, the innovation, the purpose of the innovation towards uh, solving a problem. And of course, we did talk about uh, the amount of webinar content flooded out there. So I also personally, this is, I'm responsibly uh, doing it. Uh, there are a lot of webinar happens to emphasize brand. There are a lot of webinar which emphasize to, uh, towards a communication, a brand communication. Yes, there are certain webinar happens to uh, accumulate or understand a bird view or eagle view of problems. But I still, uh, still there's a lot of room uh, for webinars to discuss about a very industry specific implementation, industry specific execution, right? So that is one of the reason uh, we wanted to organize this webinar. We are uh, including uh, Nidushan, uh, Blue Lotus and Hatch, including Curve Up came together and I always seen uh, uh, Blue Lotus and Hatch organizing webinars in terms of very industry specific. So that's one of the area that we want to cover. Right, uh, very interestingly, uh, Nelson, going forward, I'm, I'm gonna have a complete different perspective uh, about this particular subject matter expertise, right? Now, if you say SaaS platform, right, or SaaS pass, software and platform as a service from B2B, B2B, B2C clients, but I now see, edutech products coming in and I see agrotech products coming in and I see uh, ERP enterprise resource planning pro, uh, platforms coming in a very low scale where you can start using from five user levels and from there onwards talking about market automation you see a uh, customer relationship management CR coming in HRM solution and and you see a holistic solution which have all the components right so how do you see a very industry specific approach and where do you see collaboration or where do you see a contradiction 
Yeah, sure. So as far as I'd say, no company will be able to do every part of that really well, right? So, you know, you get those, the big enterprise guys who do HR systems, ERP, they do LMS, they, they try to do everything. And, and, you know, how often do people say, oh, they were amazing at everything? They're, they're not, right? And, and so this is where the idea of best of breed comes in. And right now we're living in a great time where for, for kind of software is you no longer have to buy everything from one person and, and carve out what you need from a rock. What I typically say is right now buying software is like building out a Lego because I could buy the best of breed and using APIs, they can all talk to each other, right? So I no longer need to be dependent on this one provider. I can now focus on buying the best of breed for each one of those. And I think that's what product developers should be doing. It's not saying, let me add that feature, let me do this, let me try to be everything for everyone. Instead, focus on your problem. And if you, do, if you solve that problem better than the guys who are trying to do everything, you've got to remember that problem has an owner within the company. So I'll give you an example for us. So we compete all the time against your SAPs, Oracles of the world, right? And they have their kind of add-on element. You have someone uh, who's uh, the let's, let's, let's of. We lost you. Uh, oh, can you have you got me now? The, no, no. Repeat from the example. Yeah. Yeah. So, so give me an example of, so say for example, how you've got large enterprise companies like ERP, HR system companies who also do LMSs as an add-on, right? So LMS, by LMS, I mean learning management systems for people who don't know. Um, and so they sell it as an add-on. But the thing is, we're solving a problem for a very particular stakeholder within the company. You know, we're typically within a company of a certain size, you've got someone who looks after people development and learning and development, and they own that problem within the organization. So if I can solve that problem by focusing on that problem for the stakeholder within the organization, why would they go for another platform that's trying to do everything on an average level versus buying the solution that solves my problem the best? Right. And long as you have good APIs, you can integrate and work with other enterprise systems. I think right now, the best thing you could do is focus on solving one problem really well, rather, especially as a startup. Right. Because as a startup, you don't have the resources to solve all of those problems. Right. In, in the end, what you end up doing is you end up solving each of these problems on a tiny level, that's not significant enough to compete with the big guys, right? So in order for you to be able to have the unfair advantage, you need to be able to solve one problem better than they can. And, and I think that's why in this space, you're better off kind of focusing on, on, I think, what one area. So for us, you know, we don't do talent management, we don't do performance review, we don't do HR systems, our focus, is if you want to develop your people and train your people, then we do that and we do that really well, right? Everything else, go by the best of breed. And the one thing we could promise is we can integrate with the other systems that you buy. That's our approach. Uh, uh, brilliant, uh, specifically becoming a, a problem owner, right? So most of the time you become a solution owner or multiple solution owner, but how better you know a uh, problem, right? So, okay, now, uh, since we're towards evening, I've got a few questions uh, uh, from audience as well. Uh, before diving into, uh, let me uh, push this question so that uh, the content completion there is uh, way. And also uh, this entire webinar is documented or video so that this content can be repeated. Now, uh, we have talked all this area. Now I'm just uh, gonna come into how now a little more specific, right? about you automating or digitalizing a very educational driven environment, right? And I, I personally has come across, and especially my certain current clientele, I personally come across what to outsource and what not to outsource. And before COVID, uh, what a platform can do, and post COVID, what a platform can do, the definitions are changing. 
right? So before COVID, it was a merely a governance and an automation perspective, but still the ground level execution remained to be very physical or point on contact. But now a ground level execution going virtual and especially the industry like education and industry where your hub now was be founded and was running before COVID and post COVID there's a lot of free awareness created but at the same time expectation of a common client also has gone up towards a ground uh, automation and ground delivery. While giving this holistic approach, my direct question is how much of content you create on behalf of content, uh, uh, your customers or how much of content authorization or how much content can be created by platform itself by a, a subject matter expert involving with the platform? How do you see this direction? Do you mean content in terms of marketing or content no, within no. A, a learning platform? Learn, learning platform, uh, educational right. content or training content. Right. So, so on a top level, I think um, post COVID, it's going to be a, it's a great time for ed tech, right? I, I mean, one of the, the kind of great things to come out of this is um, ed tech in general, and there will now be an accelerated shift towards digital learning, not just within the workplace, but, you know, everything from kind of schools, colleges, universities across the spectrum. We will um, and you, know, you definitely get kind of new product categories, new solutions in, in the market because that's the kind of direction things are, things are moving in. Now, specifically for us, we don't actually create any content ourselves at How Now, right? Because we don't think content is the problem. Because there, if you look at it, there's content overload. Right, you've got you've got blogs, you've got videos on YouTube, you've got online courses, you've got ebooks, you've got webinars. The challenge is how do you get the right content to the right person at the right time? Right, that's the challenge, and and that's the problem we're trying to solve because we believe if you get the right content to the right person at the right time, you will add value and people will engage with that content. So we're saying everyone is creating content, you carry on creating content, right? But how do you make sure you get it to the right person? That's our focus, right? So within the workplace, we bring all of the scattered content together because your content could live in internal systems, it could live in external systems, it could live in a Udemy content library, it could live on YouTube. We bring all of that together and then we make sense out of that content and we make sense out of who you are. What is your job title? You know, what skills do you need? How long have you been in this company? Do you like to read? Do you like to watch? Do you like to listen? Or do you like to go to a face-to-face -face training session? And so we take into account the data about you. And then based on that data, we match the content with you. Then to understand the right time, because, you know, typically what happens is um, you have a need. And at that point of need, you need learning content. And that's why Google is so successful, right? Because every time you go to Google search, you go to Google search with a need and they connect you with content at that point of need. So what we do is we integrate into all of the applications where you already work. So say for example, um, Slack. So we have a Slack app where my colleague asks me a question in Slack, rather than going to another application or going into how now, I could search how now directly from Slack and get learning content that shows up in Slack, right? So why right at my point of need, I can surface this content. Let me give you another example. Your salesperson is inside Salesforce. You're using Salesforce for the first time, so you don't know how to use it, right? Rather than going into how now, what how now does is it surfaces relevant learning content directly within Salesforce, right? So we're now able to connect the right content to the right person at the right time. So that's how we deal with it. And, and that because we don't create our own content, we're able to be sector agnostic, right? So we have banks who use us, we have technology companies who use us, we have fashion companies who use us, we have public sector that uses us, and we're able to be sector agnostic because we don't get involved in content. Uh, brilliant, I mean, I really like the science of, uh right content for the right person on the right type and the science of need 
and also not being uh, not being wanted to diversify the platform that you work along right also this comes to the environment where you don't disrupt the process of learning right because mostly uh, mostly on my very personal experience in edutech what how used to happen before in most of the organization what happening right now and uh, platforms like uh, how now can uh, easily solve a problem is not having uh, to disrupt the learning process while you're on the process you got what you need right and beautifully there's a lot of out uh, content there because i personally uh, a few days back uh, when we were on uh, discussion of automating a school environment here the exact problem popped up right uh, about yes we don't want to create content but there is a lot of content out there how do we aggregate all the content so we are accessible to it through a one single platform and beautifully uh, the infrastructure also comes into play and you're also talking about student driven mindset of not opening out the entire content without a filter so that's great so i have a uh, brilliant question and i'm i'm it's, it's a very uh, uh, eye opening for me as well personally so i just got the content of the question and i'm going to explain it or just going to ask it uh, directly so if they are running a company which is redistributing and selling uh, software programs software platforms right with this covid and saas strategies such companies who are distributing software solution what can such what should such companies do because they are not product owners they were market owners right so they were redistributing and selling a platform in a different market so right now that companies and a stakes because of this all this digital saas platform coming directly towards the customer portal uh, what such market owners has to do because it is they are no more the product owners so i think thank you uh, for the question but it's brilliant how do you see this yeah i think the same logic framework applies the only difference building the products right so they don't have control over product changes or, or kind of the change in the direction of the product but still as a reseller you you still know what the problem is and get and you're still finding the appropriate solution to solve that problem right so i think rather than building it you're sourcing a product that can solve that problem so i i think there's a lot of similarity there in the approach but i think there's more of an emphasis in owning the mind share by that what i mean is you want to be so say for example if someone in learning and development within an organization is having a conversation about solving their learning problems how now needs to be a part of that conversation right and so my focus is always how do we be a part of the conversation right and by result of being a part of the conversation you own the mind share so whenever someone's thinking about learning and development they're thinking about how now is in that mind share and so that's what the reseller should be doing they should be owning that conversation they and and that yet again goes back to what we discussed earlier around content around positioning yourself as an expert and and in fact as a reseller you're in an interesting position because you could have multiple solutions right you don't have to have one learning platform you could have three learning platforms that are very different to each other so for an organization that has one type of requirement you have a solution for one that has a very different type of you you've got another solution so you could play more of a consulting approach in in the way you position yourself right you can position yourself as an expert who's going to understand your needs and position that and i think it becomes even more important for you to be a thought leader create content that positions yourself as an expert why would i trust your recommendation right that's what you need to convince me on and um, why would i trust your recommendation and and so you know great ways of doing that is obviously creating expertise and sharing knowledge um but frameworks right helping people through the buying process because b2b software procurement is a very difficult process and and the thing is in the organization the person who buys your product is worried if they make a bad decision their job is on the line right and so you're essentially you need to help them not only buy the right product but you need to help them deliver that product in the company so they look good so your job doesn't just stop once you've sold it your job is to make sure they look good in the company 
And I think as a consultant or a reseller, that's what your focus should be. How do I make this person look good in their company? And how do I convince them that by taking this, um, you know, we always say in our sign up email, when a client signs up in our email, we say forever, you will be known as the person who changed learning in your company. Right? So that recognition to know that, yes, I'm the one who changed learning in this company. That's what we're doing for them. Uh, great. Again, uh, jump in and just uh, please, do a please. Small follow up question on that. So something what you said, the consultants, like sometimes what they think is they are, they're scared of failing the project failing. So especially when consultants, when they're recommending a product, something we realized is sometimes they reckon like oracles or SAPs, the same for you as well, because in the LMS game as well. For them, sometimes it's much more safe for them to recommend SAP or that if, if that's because even if something goes wrong, they can say it's not something is wrong with the, the product, but it's actually the implementation process or how they implemented it. So for a person like that, rather than starting a startup, betting on a startup, I, rec- I mean, recommending a company like that is much more safer. So for them, how do you sell it? So how do you convince yeah. them to sell a, a product like yours? For sure. So I think it's the support you offer that consultant, right? You need to realize that when they're taking on an SAP, SAP has an entire network to support that consultant to sell. There are support communities. There are training offers. Nelson, we lost you. Nelson, we lost you. Am I back? Yeah, you're back. Yeah. So, yeah. So, what I was saying was uh, about they have a huge support network to make this person feel confident that they would be able to take this product in. But the truth is, I've spoken to so many large corporates and enterprises who've had nightmare implementations with these large enterprise companies, right? So, the truth is, even these big guys don't get it right. So what you need to now look at is once you've told them that your implementation could go wrong, even with an SAP or an Oracle. Now, what I have here is you need to help them differentiate your product in the market, right? They don't do that job. You help them do that job, right? So they, you know what questions the customer is going to ask them. They're going to go, why am I going to go for these guys um, instead of going for an SAP? So you need to make sure it's as easy as possible for them to clearly differentiate you in the rest of the market, right? So I'll give you an example. So for us, what we do is most of our market is full of LMSs, right? So the main thing we go to the market saying is we're not an LMS, right? We think the LMS is dead, right? We think the LMS is an old product category that doesn't serve its purpose anymore. We're the anti-LMS, right? So right now, just by saying that, I've now got a clear differentiation. Right, a consultant can either go into the room saying, "I've got an, L- I've got another LMS, which there's 200 LMSs, or I've got this thing," and we named that product category. Right? We, we, I mean, it's only us because we call it an intelligent learning platform, but we now have something to call us. Right? We say we we could do most of what your LMS does, but we do a lot more, and that's why we're not an LMS. So it's not that's not the only way. But you find a way to make it easy for them to position you in the market. So when they're in that room, it's an easier answer to say, this is why we're not recommending SAP. We're recommending this, right? Because these are the three reasons why it's so different. Then you need to make sure you have the support content to facilitate that sales process. And you you do need to get involved in the implementation, right? And I think look, software implementations, if you look at why they go wrong with B2B software implementations, there, there's a number of reoccurring reasons. But one of the reasons is typically the marketing of that product within the organization, right? What happens if, with B2B SaaS, what's really difficult is the buyer is different from the end user, right? So the buyer re- buys it for because, you know, you've got features that solve their problem. But actually, the user is a large audience that have never been a part of the sales process. So you need to now go through the sales process again. But for the user, where you need to now tell them what the value is in in using your product. So say, for example, if you're using the HowNow platform. If you work in the sales team, the value is very different to if you work in the customer success team. And if you're a leader, it's very different. 
So it's our job to make sure we do, it's like a whole nother cell for each stakeholder within the business. And you need to support the consultant or partner do that, right? And this is why, you know, going back to something we discussed at the beginning is brand is not just your software, right? Brand is everything. The brand is the way you do customer support. Brand is the way you implement your product. Brand is the way you educate your partners on how to sell your product. And so often the mistake I think companies make is they stop with their product as the software. That's it. The amount of thinking that goes into, you know, what color should this button be? You know, where, where should I put this button? Doesn't go into the post sales, the implementation, the partner education. Um, and I think that's the way you differentiate yourself from an SAP. Uh, I would like to follow up question as well. Uh, is that okay fast? Just yeah, so please go ahead. Maybe so for me, uh, I'm pretty sure you'd have come across these questions as well. Like, I mean, questions or uh, problems you have faced as well, because when you're, when you're trying to raise capital, okay, especially on the LMS, because I'm pretty sure when you pitched it first, they would have said, oh, this is another LMS solution. All right. So how did you overcome it? And then when you went on follow up rounds of investments, what do you think is the, how important do you think it's to raise capital from a vertical specialized um, accelerator or investment? company how important is it sure so so the first question is is similar to what i said when you're selling to partners we didn't go in saying we're an lms right yeah that's then the yeah in the same way in the same way we position ourselves as in the same way we position ourselves as an anti lms um for partners and customers we did the same thing for investors, right? We said like, right now, uh, the LMS is worth this much as, as a market. But here's what's wrong with the LMS. So we didn't say we're different from LMS company A or LMS company B. We said we're different from all 200 LMSs. Here's why. And then what we did was we told you the reason why the LMS is broken, why the LMS is terrible. And so we need to convince you that there is a problem, right? The, the problem is this. The LMS is designed from an admin first perspective, right? It's a system of record for the administrator to prove that they're doing their job, that people are compliant, that people have done these courses, but that doesn't support a continuous learning environment. So to build a continuous learning environment, you need to be learner first, right? So if you're being learner first, that's a completely different take on the, on the learning platform perspective. And when you do it that way, you end up with a completely different product. That's not an LMS. And so that's what we did was we proved why this is broken. And we also showed them indications of how we know this is broken. To give you an example, we started talking to companies who knew their LMS was broken. So they were starting to use Slack or Facebook groups for learning inside the company, right? So if they're starting to use Slack and they're starting to use uh, you know, Skype and they're starting to use Zoom and they're starting to use Facebook groups, they know there's a problem, but they're trying to hack together their own solution. So rather than trying to hack together their own solution, what we did was we built a solution was tailored for that problem. And that's what we told the investors. We were like, look, this is a big market, but it's broken. We can go in, we can fix it. Here's why we can fix it, right? And here's what we know that they don't know. And, and here's our early traction. So that's what we did to kind of convince the investors. Um, then what was the second question again? Did uh, how important is it to raise capital from a vertical focus uh, or industry focus or accelerators or investment focus? Yeah, so I think first thing is if you need to raise money, you'll raise money, right? So the, the priority is you, you need to get the money in. However, getting um, money from domain experts who know your space adds a lot of value. And I can tell you that because I would say out of our investors, um, the guys who know the domain well have added the most amount of value, right? So it depends on what you want, right? If, if your priority right now is to get cap capital, then you know, you're gonna prioritize the capital. But if you're in a place where you know, you've got runway, you're, you're in a comfortable position, then I would definitely prioritize strategic investors or investors who know the domain. Now you might get your capital, most of your capital from a fund who has no uh, expertise in that domain. That's fine. 
but then get yourself, you know, two angels who might put a smaller ticket, but they know the space, right? They know the space because they know the buyer or, or um, you know, they understand the market. Like I, my investors who've helped the most, I could, they, for example, they, they know the HR tech space really well, right? I could pick up the phone to them when we're going through an RFE process and go, they just ask this question. What, what have you guys done when, when you've done this before? But whereas an investor who doesn't have that expertise, you can't, they can't add that value, right? And the, the truth is, as a startup, you've got so much to learn. And I would always prioritize ways where you can accelerate that learning. And the easiest way to accelerate that learning is to get a domain expert on your side. And, and so that's why I would say if you can, if you have the time, then definitely prioritize strategic or domain experts. There. Yes, uh, great. Uh, Nidushan, thank you very much uh, uh, for doing uh, those perspective of uh, the capital and investment and also how uh, a right match of investment uh, should happen. Right. Uh, I think we are towards the end, uh, but however, I'm going to uh, connect a very quick uh, learning experience about the strategic part of it because the entire talk of the day is all about platform strategy and acquisition. But I'm very sure that we covered uh, a decent attitude uh, area. But as uh, Nelson was uh, speaking to before the uh, conversation, he was like, this is a very broad ocean, right? You can keep talk about a single topic for days and weeks. But I think we this, this purpose of this particular webinar was empowerment. Uh, Nelson, if you are to give a few uh, takeaway, uh, for including for all of us, especially on what about, because I know a lot of webinars comes here to tell you about uh, the do's, right? Do this, do this, do this, do this, right? But I think the do as an action is always being, right? So you be through it and your experience is, not, there's no human doing, there's human being, right? So be your business, be whatever you want to do. But I'm very uh, conscious about uh, getting people about the experience about don't, which means definitely it's not about you don't do this, but in terms of strategic direction of SaaS and uh, platforms and B2B, what are the kind of overall don'ts that you will, a uh, few don'ts that you will give up saying that, okay, this doesn't work for us, but it might work for you. But what are those don'ts would be for you? Yeah, that's a big pause <laughs> in terms of don'ts. And I think don'ts as, a, don'ts as a founder as well. I often say, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about SaaS, but... I talk about the FAF model, which is failing as a founder model, because you spend oh. more time uh, screwing up things and uh, you, you spend more time failing things than you do getting things right. But the, the truth is you only need to be right once and it makes a massive difference in your business. And so, you know, in terms of don'ts, I, I really wouldn't prescribe, you know, like you said, what didn't work for me, it doesn't necessarily mean it's not going to work for you. But I think the bigger thing I take away as a founder is I think the only difference is so I, I often think about the idea of you just jumped out of a plane with a parachute and before you hit the ground, you need to figure out how to open the parachute. Now, how quickly you hit the ground is how much cash you have in the bank, right? Now, every time you get close to hitting the ground, you raise more money and then you go back up again. So you, you, you buy a bit more distance. But what you're trying to figure out is how to open that parachute. Now, if you take that idea, I think I genuinely believe the fastest learner wins right in this game so the question between your competitor and you isn't how much money they have and, and how much money you have because if that was the case startups would never survive right because the incumbent always has more money than the startup the question is how quickly would you figure things out and that's my number one measurement personally is how quickly am i figuring things out and the moment i figure something out the question i ask myself is how could I have figured that out quicker, right? I've now learned this lesson, but could I have learned this lesson earlier if I had done something different? Because that's all that matters. Are you learning and are you learning quick enough? And so I think it's less about the do's and don'ts and more about, you know, how do you know what you're doing right now is right, right? How do you know you're selling to the right customer? How do you know you're using the right marketing channels? How do you know you've got the right features in your product? How do you know you should raise money or not? There's a lot of uh, areas that you don't know. And that's fine. 
because that's the nature of the game, right? And that's why so many of us love it is because it's thrilling to not know. But the question is, how quickly can you figure it out? And so I guess as a don't or, or do, either way you want to take it, I, I would say the one tech key takeaway for me is, is how quickly can you learn and how quickly can you figure it out? Yes, uh, great. Uh, so it was wonderful, nice to uh, hear it from Nelson about how quickly you learn. And that's one of the reason he is uh, on how now as well. So he wants to make the learning accelerated. Uh, yes, uh, the, the quick takeaway that what I wanted to revolve around is uh, responsibly as, as a training development company and also uh, Nidushan from Blue Lotus who continuously empower along with Hatch who has done continuous webinar a uh, great justice to do a knowledge share out there. And Nelson, who has given time here, we wanted to be very responsible about the strategies we talked about. It's something which has worked around us, right? It's very subjective about how they use and the context, how they play. The entire intention of this is to make sure that there is something like this can also be added into your portfolio of strategies that you are looking forward towards your success. There was some great learning and my very personal great learning was uh, deliver the content of the right need at the right time and you deliver at the need. And also your yeah, uh, fam uh, uh, found, found as a failing model about uh, you figure out the things faster and get your learning faster. And also my addition to that would be do, you, you can't fail any number of times. Like again, taking the parachute example, you want to land, land, uh, crash any number of times, but do not crash and land for the same reason twice, right? So that's my uh, personal learning to be going learning. Uh, yes, uh, so there were a few questions out there which I compromised into one question and asked. Uh, again, uh, really thanking everyone. Uh, before me, uh, close it off. Uh, is there anything, Nidushan, you would like to add on? Uh, no, that's about it. It's passed. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, Yes, yeah, uh, yes. Uh, Nelson, again, thank you very much for the great time that you have given. And also, uh, team, guys, that you can also uh, get to know about uh, HowNow from uh, gethownow.com. Uh, so explore that as well, uh, the intelligent learning platform is empowering. And uh, thank you very much uh, for get uh, HowNow, Nelson, Nidushan uh, from Blue Lotus, and Hatch for the entire support the team of Hatch who has done. And we made this webinar as flawless. And I think we just had a few quick uh, discussion just before the webinar because we wanted to make the content to be real. Uh, rather, Otherwise, we would have pre-discussed the question and we do have done a video and put it out, which we are good at content. So again, uh, wishing all the very best for people who are out there and wishing all your SaaS platforms and your strategies to work forward. And yeah, so that's uh, it uh, from me. Yes, Sanidu, you can just give it a closure. Um, it has been a fantastic session. Uh, thanks, Nelson, uh, coming on board, first of all, and uh, some great insights that were shared. And, and thanks to us for doing this moderation part. I, as you know, you have been in the EduTech space for the last decade, so I thought you would do a better... Uh, I, I'm sure you would have got better questions than me. That's why I just brought you in. And thank you, of course, for Hatch coming on board. Of course, they, they have a very large audience with them. And I thought of opening this for more startups so that there's a lot of companies who can learn from this. And thanks again. And thanks. Thank you. Yes. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me. Thank you.